Hello, everyone. Welcome to the March 7th edition of the Scientific Governance and Risk Meeting. Um, I say this every time, but I'm going to say it again. This is going to be a good call because we have some interesting things happening uh, in MakerDAO in general, and we have some interesting guests joining us today. Um, usually, I have a brief little preamble, and I immediately hand it off to Stephen to do the heavy lifting, but Stephen's not here today. Uh, it's both Stephen and Rune are traveling. So we're going to be left to our own devices, and I need to uh, explain the agenda myself. So I'm going to have two preambles today. The first one is that we are intensely interested in our community, uh, and our community is uh, probably the smartest community in all of crypto. So if anybody has questions, uh, please type those questions in the chat if you don't have access to a microphone. Uh, if you do have access to a microphone, please feel free to jump into the conversation. Um, so interrupt people if you feel you need to, if it's important. Otherwise, wait for uh, a pause and then let us know what you're thinking. Um, we have uh, a lot of deep thinkers in these calls, and it behooves everybody to, to have a spot at the podium and share your experience in this space. I know personally, I am no financial genius, so any additional insights I can glean from these calls are enormously useful for me. I want to uh, talk a bit about our agenda today. Uh, we have, uh, we're spicing this one up a bit because we think reasonably sure this is the first time we've had a special guest in this call. Um, we've had interest in the past, but um, I think that uh, we're very serious about Maker Down. We're serious about financial systems, <clears throat> excuse me, and we're just generally serious people on these calls. And I, I wanted to find a serious project to help kick us off. And Dharma uh, is up to some interesting things. And we we like Dharma and we like the people that work there and we like what they're doing. Uh, and they've just released a new product called Lever. And so we have Nadav and Max Bronstein are in the call today. Um, after the preamble is over, we're going to kick it over to them to get an explanation about what Libra is all about, how it works, uh, why that's interesting for uh, the DAI ecosystem, and maybe dig into some of the, the mechanics of how they've designed their tool. I'm also actually, well, yeah, okay, so the next item on the agenda too is after we finish talking about uh, Dharma and why that's interesting, we'll dig into um, recent governance uh, events, a major the thing that we obviously need to keep on talking about is the stability of the peg and uh, how the activities that we've been taking in these calls have been affecting that. And those activities being for the people that are just joining us for the first time, <clears throat> excuse me, we've had a, a governance poll that we've uh, we posted uh, three days ago to determine uh, the, the community's appetite for a larger change than the one that we previously discussed. A change was to raise the stability fee by an additional 2% uh, to a total of 3.5%. Uh, and we saw that uh, there was a tremendous, it seemed to be a tremendous level of uh, support for that decision almost immediately. Within 24 hours, we saw 40,000 uh, maker uh, staked in support. Um, and actually, the thing that I find most interesting and, and very encouraging is that we saw nine makers staked in opposition. Uh, and, and that may sound a bit silly and a bit cute, but I think that there's a tremendous amount of value to, to seeing that because uh, with any kind of voting system, especially with something that's a lot like a shareholders vote that we have here, um, signaling uh, disagreement, even when in the face of overwhelming opposition is important. So it's, it's very important that our community gets together and understands that uh, this is a signaling method, and just because you've seen somebody already sort of move in a direction that you either thought you wanted to move in or disagrees with your position doesn't mean it's time to just you know, not get involved. It's important for everybody to see that there are uh, outliers here and there are dissenting opinions. So if you disagree with a poll, make sure that you vote, even if you don't think that's going to make a huge difference. There's a signal there that needs to be understood. Now that uh, I think the, the poll is scheduled to end any minute now, I believe. Um, obviously, there's not a lot to discuss about the ambiguities of that. It's fantastically. Uh, I think the poll support. has ended. Has it? Yeah. OK, cool. The system works. All right. Uh, and so what we need to talk about now is what happens next. And what happens next is um, that we talk about the poll. Uh, which was scheduled for this call. I'm not sure. Well, I'll be interested in seeing what that conversation looks like. Um, we'll get into that after the Dharma presentation. But the next step is tomorrow, 
uh, we initiate an executive vote. And that executive vote will be implementing uh, a new state of the MakerDAO ecosystem. And that new state includes uh, the increased ability fee. And uh, that, that voting mechanism is continuous approval. So as long as uh, the, the vote to uh, increase the stability fee has more people staking their, their maker there than they do in the previous vote, then that will be enacted. And, and probably the most, my favorite part of the system, strangely enough, is the fact that anybody can actually execute that, that, that change in the system. So once, once we've, we've tipped the balance into the new uh, state, I think the last couple of times somebody on the internet has actually executed the, the new face of MakerDAO for us and saved us the 36 cents in gas, which I appreciate. I think that that is probably, oh, we already have a pile of questions here. David, is there anything that we need to address or? Uh, I don't know, it's just. It's, it's just uh, people talking in the chat. Okay, cool. Um, I think that leaves the, the top high level agenda specified. Um, so we're going to talk to Dharma for a bit, and then we're, I'm going to hand it over to Cyrus uh, as the uh, the face of the interim risk team to provide some context and maybe dig into whether we saw anything interesting in the last week or what interesting things we can expect to see in the future. Um, and then after that, uh, if time allows, I want to talk a bit about how we're going to optimize this governance process a bit because there's a. Are we also going to be talking? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, totally. I actually asked for it, so go ahead. I was just asking, are we going to be talking also about potentially raising the debt ceiling? Yeah, and that's going to be something that uh, Cyrus is going to dig into. Sorry, did I just cut you off, Cyrus? You want to talk about that? Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. Yeah, we'll, we can talk, talk a little bit about that later. Yeah, we're in a position where we have to kick off this executive vote, and then we need to see what happens. So uh, at this point, next steps are going to be theoretical. But yeah, it's a just conversation that, that Cyrus will be leading us through. Does that make sense, Matthew? Yep. Cool. Um, if time allows, at the end of the call, I would like to start talking about um, how we optimize this process a bit, because governance, surprisingly, is a fantastically complicated thing, not only from a, a sociological standpoint or a game theoretical standpoint, but just mechanically, it's tricky. Uh, we need to figure out how do we uh, communicate with the community, where do we post our notices, how do we make sure people are informed, how do we maintain those debates, how do we try to turn around uh, our voting process in a short enough time frame for us to maintain uh, agility and velocity and, and try and stay ahead of the requirements for the, that the risk team sets for us in order to maintain that type, which I think would be interesting too. All right, well, that was a bit of speechifying. I am done with that. The next thing I want to do, actually, before I turn it over to or introduce Dharma, I want to uh, introduce someone else, a new old face or an old new face. I'm not sure that either of those things sound very flattering, but we, we have a new addition to the team uh, in the form of Kenny Rowe. Uh, the reason I say new old is that Kenny is an OG at MakerDAO. He was there at the outset, uh, took a little detour, and now he's back. Um, Kenny, are you, do you want to give us a little introduction? Hey, Rich. Uh, well, uh, hey. that's that's... That sounds pretty much, you know, the the course. Um, so I I, I joined uh, Rune and the team probably a few months after uh, they had initially got together and came up with the e dollar, which was that Reddit post uh, back in I think twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen. Um, like uh, Rich said, it took a little bit of time doing working on another pro another project, which um, you know didn't didn't work out so well. But um, today I'm I'm back and it feels very much like a, a homecoming for me. But I'm very interested in in governance and uh, community, and these are very much the problems I want to be working on. So, um, yeah, looking forward to it. Right, I'm I'm excited to have you back. Uh, it's that deep insight into the system, which I think is enormously valuable, uh, and uh, experience with governance and and taking some hard knocks in the past and, and come through it and having deep insight to how these things work is going to be valuable for everyone. So Kenny will be working with the community development team, uh, particularly in the areas of governance, and he'll be picking up some of the heavy lifting uh, and also uh, specifically involved with some of the things that I just talked about, where how do we optimize this process? How do we ensure that, that voting uh, is transparent and visible and maintains velocity and responsive to community needs uh, in a way that 
allows us to do that in less than five days. So that's kind of the challenge right now. It's going to be tough. So we'll figure out what that looks like. OK. Um, do we have any questions we need to address in the side thing? Oh, actually, hold on, wait. Sorry, missed it. Hi, uh, Christine Kim asks, uh, hi, guys. Question about the executive vote and the tipping to the new state. Any good resources people can link me to about how it works and has worked in the past? Uh, yeah, Christine, I'm going to post the link in the in the chat for you of actually a really great article that somebody in our community did. Yeah, there's a great article. There's mechanics, too, available. And this is a resource that we need to keep on pushing as much as possible. But also, MakerDAO is kind of, of the central. It's the ancient scrolls and the central archive of uh, everything that's happening in the system. It, it can be a bit daunting, but it's always a great place to start if you want to figure out what's going on. OK, uh, the preambles are over. So I want to, I want to introduce Nadev and Max uh, from Dharma, because I'm very, very interested in hearing about how uh, Libra works um, and digging into some of the internals and then maybe getting into a little discussion about uh, how that affects MakerDAO ecosystem. So. Uh, who would like to kick us off, Max or Nadev? Um, I can start off. Um, so first of all, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, and just just so I know, what sort of time window do we have for this discussion right now? Uh, I blocked off fifteen minutes, but we can go long if uh, something okay. really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll try to keep it tight to there to to respect you guys' sure. time. Um, yeah. So basically, um, Dharma is a peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending marketplace for cryptocurrencies um, that is administered entirely by smart contracts. Um, and, uh, you know, specifically for the, con in the context of DAI, we, we recently announced our integration of DAI into the product. Um, and so right now you can go onto dharmalever.com and either lend out your DAI for an interest rate or, um, uh, essentially put up some ether and borrow DAI against that. Um, the kind of internal mechanics of the system, um, are in, in many many ways similar to the way CDPs work, um, but have some subtle differences to them. Um, so uh, one one kind of big difference is that loans in, in Dharma are, are fixed term. So whereas a CDP can be taken out and you kind of uh, have this uh, like infinite time window in which uh, you are allowed to hold your die, um, in, in Dharma, there's a, there's a cap on that time window. Uh, and typically speaking in the system right now, people are doing 28 day loans, but theoretically it could be um, any variety of different numbers. Um, the reason why this, this exists is that uh, in Dharma, there, there are, you know, there are two sides to the marketplace. There are lenders and borrowers um, and lenders have an interest in having some sort of uh, timeline on getting their capital back. Um, and so, uh, it's, it's, you kind of, you have to inject a lot of the dynamics of the peer to peer lending marketplace, uh, into, into the system. Um, so, um, beyond that though, um, the system, uh, the way that the contracts work, um, on an individual loan basis are, are very similar to the way CDPs work there. Um, loans are over collateralized currently to, to the same extent as, as CDPs are required to be um actually a little bit lower but but um currently to to a similar sort of extent um and there is a price feed that essentially um mediates uh when the position can be closed by third party arbitrager uh and liquidated um and liquidation processes are again very very akin to to maker or or, or compound in, in that work um, you know, somebody essentially comes and purchases the underlying collateral um, using the principal uh, at some sort of discount in order to uh, incentivize the action. Um, so that's, you know, really quick, like high level on, on Dharma and how, on how it works. Um, kind of biggest thing that we have been pouring our energy to, into in the short term has been just honestly usability. Um, we've made, made it a giant priority to basically build a platform that um, is accessible not just to uh, MetaMask users, but also to you know anybody who has just a normal cryptocurrency wallet. Um, so you know, taking a step back, what what does this mean for Dai and the uh, the MakerDAO ecosystem? Um, obviously, we are immense, immensely uh, enamored with the the Dai ecosystem, and have I mean, it's just such an incredible 
inspiration to us to see what maker has done um and um i think i think you know like right now it's it's early days we just launched the die integration and so you know i i will caveat that this is all very like theoretical conversation of what happens if if we manage to get a lot more liquidity um but if that is the case and you know like hopefully we we hope that is going to be the case um there's going to be some very interesting dynamics um between products like dharma as in like peer-to-peer -peer lending markets um and then the kind of core issuance system of of maker and die in general specifically with regards to the stability fee um so for instance right now um we're in a place where um the lever um interest rate is you know kind of significantly lower than the maker stability fee that uh we are moving to um which as far as i've understood it um like at least in in the current frame of of maker's goals in, in increasing the stability fee is actually um quite advantageous in that um essentially there is a uh, those who are trying to uh, borrow die for leverage um, have essentially an alternative that doesn't involve minting more die and adding more die supply um, and is kind of economically cheaper. Um, and so uh, in, in situations like right now where where maker wants to just dis disincentivize die creation, um, it is actually beneficial to have essentially a, a alternative that is almost like the equivalent of of getting die on the secondary market in a sense um uh to use kind of a little bit of a crass analogy um, well, that's an interesting thing to discuss actually because uh, compound actually uh said something interesting in a tweet yesterday i think in relation to the interplay between maker dow and, and uh, other lending facilities that are offering cheaper rates that eventually there needs to be an equilibrium or an equilibrium will be reached Actually, mm -hmm. whether people like it or not between the various lending platforms. And then the, the question becomes, I think, a, a matter of value add and target demographics, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, that people will be either moving from Uniswap to, to Compound to Lever or... or also to risk. Or make or down. Yeah, actually, yeah, also that's a great risk. point, Chris. If you, I think they... Did yeah. you mention that at somewhere on, on the Twitters? But, well, it's just... It's the idea that there will be different interest rates because these different credit facilities will have different amounts of risk that go with them. And so we would expect the lowest cost credit facility um, to be um, operating, most, operating most efficiently um, and hopefully be um, operating most efficiently because it, at least in the case of Maker, um, although it'll be interesting to see how secondary markets play into this, but if it's got the biggest insurance pool, then it's the lowest risk. Um, and then as you go up, there are incremental layers of risk, but I'm not sure how that ends up playing into the secondaries. Um, it's worth thinking about more. Yeah, I'm yeah, clear on I that as well. Where, Sorry, where I would be, um, where, where I get pause on the thought of, of the effect of these secondary markets on, um, on Maker, is uh, in competition over collateralization um, in that um, we kind of have, uh, we have the liberty of being able to have a market driven approach to what, like figuring out what the rate of collateralization or required collateralization is going to be on loans. Um, and so, you know, right can now- you speak we're a bit to how, to how you determine um, that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you can think of, um, what, what's different about something like Dharma and Compound is that there are no like global parameters uh, in in Dharma that like you know uh, essentially draw a line in the sand that all loans must be X percent collateralized. Um, it's it's a it's just a peer to peer lending marketplace where people put out different offers and requests for loans, and so I can say um, you know I am willing to invest in any loan um, that is at least 100% collateralized at time of issuance. Um, or I can dial that number in any direction. Sure, um, I mean, I, maybe I misunderstood. So I, but as far as Lever goes, though, you're kind of in a different world, though, right? Like you do need to specify some minimal collateralization ratio. Yes, yes. But like the point being that like that, that is an application layer constraint right now that we are enforcing. But like, mm -hmm. 
um, that's very much due to the conservatism of where we are right now. And it's, it's very likely that we're going to lower those thresholds over time. Um, and the reason why we, we feel comfortable doing that is because whereas Maker has the kind of primary goal of upholding a peg, um, we, you know, like that, that is not necessarily in our uh, incentive system. So it's really, a, it's really just about kind of making sure the market clears in, in our, uh, from our standpoint. And so um, where I think it gets interesting is that, um, and, and, and again, I'll, I'll say this again, it gives me pause on what this means for the maker ecosystem uh, if, if we manage to kind of achieve meaningful traction is, is that, um, you know, I think we all know that uh, die holders or rather die issuers um, uh, by, by and large tend to be um, essentially uh, minting die for leverage purposes um the biggest kind of uh uh lever no no pun intended that that actually kind of affects how much leverage you can get is not um the stability fee or interest rate but rather the uh, collateralization ratio um and so um it would be um i think that that like i guess like i said I, i'm not i haven't totally thought through this yet but um I think if anything, that will be a more interesting number to watch with regards to how these different protocols kind of compete for liquidity um, uh, than the so stability. Let me, let me just frame rate. that though. So, you, so you're saying that the collateralization ratio is a lever that you guys use, and obviously it's, it's a lever that we don't. Um, we talk right. about stability fees or in the future, uh, die savings rates, and potentially at some point, possibly a debt ceiling adjustment. But for, for your model, seems like you have obviously significantly more flexibility so it's the, the collateralization ratio is the primary lever that you guys are talking about uh in the context of this conversation yes um and and, and yeah i mean I, I again this is like a perhaps a half-baked thought um but uh i think that the the longer um um, perhaps to put it bluntly, the longer that the primary die minting use case is leverage, um, if that remains the case forever, then that puts, um, that in my opinion, puts the maker system in a bit of a fragile position insofar as it is competing with other platforms that don't necessarily need to care about upholding a global peg, but rather, um, you know, only want to clear individual trades. Um, well, yeah, it's so, an interesting discussion because it, it depends on the competitiveness of decentralized stable coins in the space. And right now, that, right. that comp competition is obviously in our favor because we're the only game in town. So, it, with a tool like Lever, uh, if mm -hmm. the primary use case is, is uh, lending and or borrowing DAI or ETH, um, that that DAI needs to come from somewhere, and that somewhere is making yeah. it out right now. So, all what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing implicit in the conversation too is a um, race to lower collateralization ratios, which increases risk, which then makes all of these systems more fragile. Um, and so that's Nadav. I think that's that's also what I hear you getting at, and how that's you know maybe it's okay on a secondary issuance platform, but if the primary issuance platform succumbs to the competitive pressures of a secondary platform, then if the primary platform hits um, a serious glitch, then everything unwinds. And so protecting the primary platform from the drive to increase collateral efficiency by decreasing the ratios, um, I think is gonna be an important piece of discipline. One of the other quick yeah. question I have on that, I mean, Maker and its fundamental core is basically a repo facility with an unlimited time horizon and the term you're outlining of 30 days, or maybe you have more terms. I mean, you're basically constructing a repo with a time horizon and a reverse repo, um, which is very interesting. I mean, it's a separate product. I mean, reverse repos don't exist right, right. now for Maker. Um, and the way you right. set it up, at least the way I've seen it on the site, it's basically almost a Uniswap model of a repo and a reverse repo. Is that correct? Um, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not extremely literate in the, the term like repo slash reverse repo. So I, I don't feel like I'm qualified to say whether that's that's the case or not. But, uh, you know, I would agree with the sentiment that it is fundamentally a different type of debt product. 
um, in like that it's it's a fixed term facility and not uh, an open ended facility. That's interesting. Actually, uh, you always have great questions. So if you want to jump on the mic. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just typed one in. Oh, yeah. Can you turn your sound off? Sorry, I'm with the. <laughs> um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yes, yeah, so I just typed it in. But I guess, Nadav, how are you guys actually uh, keeping this lending and borrowing rate at 0.1%? At um, isn't if it's a peer to peer marketplace for debt like how are you guys like are you just like sort of artificially enforcing this and who's taking the risk there yeah um that's a great question so i mean yeah like the the answer is we are absolutely artificially enforcing that right now so so you know as an artifact of um the fact that we just launched this and we want to you know incentivize liquidity um we are subsidizing the difference right now from our own balance sheet um, that is not going to last forever um, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, well, what does that transition with... into? Are you moving into an algorithmic sort of model where the market will determine what these results are? Or do you? Um, we are moving into rates? into like an order book based model essentially. So so the idea being that like you know there will be different offers that lenders have, uh, and that on the borrow side you'll be matched with the kind of best offer that's available. Um, so the rates that you're seeing right now, admittedly, are not necessarily reflective of of how things will look in the longer term. Um, but I, I do think that um, you know it, it's worth kind of talking through the different uh, scenarios of what what happens when the rate is like either lower than the stability fee for CDPs or or higher than the stability fees for CB, CDPs. So, sorry to just kind of follow up my question. Um, so obviously, you know, in in the maker ecosystem, ultimately, like MKR token holders are are kind of taking the risk, right? Who who's taking the risk on your end? Is it the is it the lender, um, who's who's basically lending out this die, or where's that risk going? Um, yes, that's correct. It is it is the lender. Um, so it's and it's not like. Uh, there's not a singular lender for the whole system, right? Like there is, a, it's individual lenders in individual positions. Okay, got it. So I guess that's kind of the, that's kind of the difference between borrowing die at Maker versus borrowing die at, uh, you know, at, at one of these sort of secondary platforms, um, which, which kind of makes sense. Obviously, I think these rates will probably go up a little bit over time, but um, but this is this is interesting. What yeah. is, what is the recourse? What's the recourse like for um, for lenders? How does that work? Yeah, it's it's very similar to the way um, like uh, I think the the closest analog is Compound, where essentially um, a third party arbitrageur slash liquidator um, once they see that the collateral has fallen below a certain value um, or the LTV rather has risen above a certain value, they can come in and purchase the underlying collateral um at like a discount um and then that will essentially compensate the the lender uh, and the remainder of the collateral will return to the borrower have you thought about what the implications are going to be whenever there's a savings rate on die uh yes we have yeah <laughs> the, that's that's pretty interesting for us um well look okay first of all i think it's important to, to take a step back from from our narrow position like we we don't live only in the universe of die like we you know we plan on listing many crypto assets and so um it, it's not necessarily what keeps us up at night alone but with that being said if we if we narrow in on just kind of die as a market um yeah i think it's really interesting i i think like i, I frankly i don't know enough about the die savings rate and um and kind of why a why why it's being added but b how it works and, and where kind of the um the interest rate is coming from and so uh I, yeah i don't feel extremely qualified to comment on it but I, I think like it will be it will be very interesting to see how how those two rates kind of interplay off each other yeah i can chime in uh briefly so my understanding and correct me if i'm wrong is that the die savings rate will be a function of the stability fee so it will always be less than the stability fee and I think kind of what we saw on Compound is that like secondary avenues to get DAI um, will be important just because like, you know, people will have demand to pay down their CDPs um, and, you know, they don't necessarily like want to be taking like a tax burden or or anything like that. So if the savings rate is is sort of low, there might be a willing lender who will want to try and play the market. 
and get a higher rate for like a more desperate borrower. I want to I want to clear up something about the uh, collateralization ratio, or maybe I'm misunderstanding you guys, but um, I think there's this implicit assumption that we are not ever going to use the collateralization ratio as a as a tool, or that it can't be changed. Um, I think it can definitely be lowered. Um, you know, the 150% was just kind of something that was set a long time ago. Uh, in my opinion, based on the data I've looked at, it's fairly conservative. Uh, so I think it comes down to on a liquidity adjusted basis, you know, who can offer the best, you know, average collateralization rate. Um, so debt ceiling for DAI right now is about 100 million. Um, obviously going to go up. I mean, having, you know, a couple peer-to-peer -peer loans offering at one-to-one -one rate is not really a, uh, you know, significant um, impact there. And I also think that it's possible that there are potentially different buckets in the make maker ecosystem where you can have the same collateral, but, you know, uh, divide up the debt ceiling into different basically different risk profiles. Um, so yeah, so I, th I think that you need to control for the liquidity amount and, you know, if you control for the liquidity, then it kind of comes down to uh, who has, I mean, where is the largest insurance pool who can kind of, you know, satisfy the most amount of um, liquidity and, you know, really also risk evaluation is important as well. Um, I mean, as Chris said, it might be a race to the lowest rate, but that's also dangerous because obviously if you get too low, then you could have a catastrophe of sorts happen. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure how you guys all see it, but I, I think that there's definitely um, some nuances there that aren't and exactly it, uh, being discussed. It may I think, also be there, sorry, Nadav, go ahead. Go ahead, Alex, please. I, I, was, I was gonna quickly add to that. Um, there, there's also a two-way feedback loop here in the sense of there's no, there's no particular reason why there should be one collateralization ratio that necessarily applies to all CDPs. And I think I've heard this discussed in the context of multi-collateral DAI, where we could have, you know, 125% collateralization, but with a higher stability fee, you know, 110 with an extremely high stability fee or whatever else, right? Like whatever makes sense. Uh, and that borrowers can really choose, you know, what suits their particular needs. This is where the two-way feedback loop comes in, is if the peer-to-peer -peer market on Dharma is giving us information as to how different lenders are assessing different collateralization ratios from a risk perspective and seeing what the different interest rates that they charge de dependent on the collateralization ratio are, and those can be very useful from a policy perspective to the make or risk teams when they're deciding these parameters for the system. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think I think that's like that's 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 a really important point. Uh, Is it, because sorry, Matthew. I was gonna say I don't know if it's a feedback loop or an opportunity for arbitrage. Um a little bit of both I'd say. <laughs> and arbitrage um, is obviously something that we desperately need more of in the in this market. So. Uh, I want to. We've actually gone a bit over time. So, uh, Dev, if you have, or Max, you guys have any final thoughts or or something you want to leave us with uh, about the tool and how we could possibly check it out? That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, so, two things. First of all, I saw that there were some additional questions um, that are either posted in the chat or that people didn't get a chance to totally finish. Um, by all means, um, if you want to shoot me an email afterwards or a message on Telegram, what af or what what have you, with, with follow up questions, please feel free to. My emails. The dob at dharma.io. Um, happy to answer any questions. Um, number two, um, you know, uh, as the inner brain trust here of, of Maker, we'd love to have you guys try and play with the tool. Um, I mean, we, we take a lot of pride in thinking that we built like a fantastic experience for either earning interest on your die or or kind of borrowing more. Um, so uh, if you guys shoot us a message, we can we'd be happy to kind of uh, bump you guys' spot on our wait list uh, and get you into the system earlier. We have some kind of secret uh, referral code that people can reference. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just, uh, just, just shoot me a, a message on Telegram. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, right, 
everybody we'll use that reputation system. Swamp it right. up on Telegram. You've heard it here. All right. Cheers, guys. All right. Thanks Thank for coming. That was really interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Thank you guys for coming. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for having us. So let's uh, let's dig into um, stability fees, governance, and the rest of that rigmarole. So I'm, I'm posting a link in the chat to a discussion thread that's related specifically to this call. So if you're asking questions and you feel that they weren't addressed appropriately, we ran out of time. Uh, the, the point of these MakerGov threads are to continue these discussions uh, for the next 24 hours or so, or for however long it takes, but to make sure that these important threads aren't being lost. So uh, if you have questions, you can add them to that thread. After the call, I'll post a summary of the major points that we discussed here with links to transcripts and video and audio and all the rest, and then we can continue the chats. But at this point, what I want to do is uh, hand the call over to uh, our internal risk team in the guise of Cyrus Unessi. Uh, and we can talk about uh, think issues around how uh, the governance poll went and what we think next steps might be. And hopefully look at a number or two. Sure. Um, OK, so before we dive into the stability fee and the vote, I um, just want to quickly talk a little bit about the methodologies that we're using, uh, just so everybody's sort of on the same page. Um, so first, the main issue really uh, is how do, you, how do we even track or gauge the price of dye? Um, so I'm going to quickly present um, just one source that we're using. Uh, we shared this last week as well. Um, this is the uh, die.stablecoin.science uh, created by uh, one of our, um, by Lev, who many of you know in the maker community. Um, so yeah, so a few things to glean from this graph. Um, obviously, we are not quite at a dollar yet. Um, and oh, sorry, before I get into that, uh, we're looking at uh, centralized exchanges um, such as Coinbase, the DAI USDC uh, price is great. Uh, also looking at Bitfinex. Uh, we're looking at decentralized exchanges, uh, primarily ETH to DAI. Also looking at some 0x exchanges and Uniswap. We're also gauging several OTC quotes from uh, various OTC market makers. Um, and yeah, kind of taking a weighted average and using that to evaluate uh, the price of DAI. Um, what we are point, working- sorry, can, I don't sure. want to wreck your flow here, but at some point soon-ish, we're going to be augmenting these things to give us some more data points to think about, right? Like something like right. a, an average yeah. ETH or the ETH, current ETH price overlaid on top of this and a stability fee uh, polling, a stability fee uh, line would be great, and maybe even some vertical lines to specify when governance actions happen to maybe try and dig for some correlations, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think we will be working on a dashboard of sorts where uh, it will be easy for MKR holders to kind of gauge at least visually what's been happening, um, and get a get a nice picture that way. Um, also, looking at stuff like CDP destructions, uh, CDP wipes. Um, maybe, you know, wallet activity, just a a anything that can help us gauge the impact of our, of our policy tools that um, while controlling for uh, other variables. Um, yeah, it's the, the risk with graphs are always that humans are designed to create narratives. So you look at uh, these pretty pink bubbles and then you create a narrative here. And at the risk of doing precisely that, um, can we offer any theories about why the peg seems to have uh, deviated in the last day. Uh, actually, I think Chris uh, mentioned this in the chat. Like, It looks like after the vote, this, this is where narratives come in. So we, we do a vote. And from our perspective, obviously, that vote is the biggest thing that happened in the crypto market. And therefore, if the peg has deviated since then, it's because of our vote. And I'm not sure that that's a. No, I, that's not. No, what I, what I was suggesting was um, that the signal that we're raising rates like I thought would have like a positive effect, but uh, I think Louis has uh, some some insight into this. Yeah, guys, um, can I jump in here? Uh, I think it's really important to recognize how the uh, demand for dye is is inversely correlated with 
what's going on in crypto markets generally. If crypto markets are really bearish, uh, you're going to see lots of demand for DAI as people risk off. I'm just going to post a chart that I just mocked up literally in the last five seconds. So it's going to be a little we bit can dirty. Share your screen if you like. But uh, have a look at that. You can basically see that when when ETH pumped just in the last few days, which is like that orange line jumping up, that coincides with the die price taking a dive on Coinbase. So basically what you see is uh, when people are buying ETH, they're effectively selling die. Um, Sorry, we don't have access to that graph. It, it, yeah. Do you have like a private browsing session you can share or something? Hold on, I just have give me, give me one sec. Uh, this should do it. So, um, Joe Q from the, the Maker team can uh, either agree or disagree on this, but basically in, in December uh, 2018, when ETH was crashing to $80, there was so much demand for DAI that um, Maker's inventories basically ran dry, and that's why they lowered the stability fee to half a percent. Now, the market has subsequently risen from there, and that's basically what's caused the, the bloating of all the market maker's balance sheets. Um, I think it's really important, like people have been talking about like structural problems with uh, the supply and demand dynamics with DAI. I, there are more people that want to get cheap leverage than there are people that want to use DAI for like natural utility purposes. I think the, the much more significant factor is just the cyclicality of the market. Um, so what we're going to see going forward is in a bear market, there'll be lots of demand for DAI. Uh, and in a bull market, there'll be less demand for die because people will be selling die to risk on. And the other uh, thing you'll see in a bull market is that as ETH goes up and as collateral types in multi-collateral uh, die, as their value increases, CDP owners will get uh, basically more headroom to issue more die as their collateral ratio goes up with the market. So in a bull market, you're going to see a lot more issuing of die and you're going to see less demand for die. So, you know, the, the savings rate will come into that, but uh, what you saw in the market um, around the stability fee vote, uh, I think that that's just noise. What was actually happening was ETH was going up, which puts selling price, uh, selling pressure on DAI. So, you know, one, one of the points that I really wanted to make is that market makers inventory is really the lead indicator for the die price. Um, so we really need to be, you know, why uh, makes markets for die, you know, maker makes markets for die. I feel like we really need to, to uh, keep our inventories in mind uh, because that's really the lead indicator as our inventories grow. That basically shows that we're getting unidirectional flow and something needs to change. Um, I think there's also a broader discussion around uh, you know, with the market makers around letting the die price float a little more freely so we can, uh, you know, see these signals in the price, not just on our balance sheets. Well, maybe, maybe you can talk about that because you've said like three really interesting things I want to dig into, but exactly how do you agree letting the, or how do you propose letting that price float a bit more? How does that work? So it would basically, <laughs> you know, okay, so uh, like the, the history here is like a, a little uh, complicated uh, around how we were pricing die because, you know, uh, as a kind of uh, message of goodwill, we were basically holding it at par when the spot rate was not at par uh, and we were subsequently getting arbitrage. So we had to move down with the market. But, you know, if we, you know, Maker is, has market making operations, we have market making operations, other trading desks are trading die. Um, basically, moving moving our orders uh, and moving the price in line with changes in, in our inventory will basically allow the signals in the market to become obvious to everybody, right? Um, I think what's sure. happened over the last few months is that, you know, we've had growing inventories and that hasn't, the, why that's occurred and the, the impact that is going to have in the future hasn't been effectively communicated to people people haven't recognized the significance of it. Um, I know that uh, it's been brought up a few times that uh, Maker now has uh, infantry of uh, 1, 5, 15 million die. Uh, so it's gone from zero in the bear market to 15 million. You know, if Ethan sells off again, you'll see the same thing. I'm sure those infantries will go to zero. 
Uh, sure. So let's yeah. try and wrap this up because I, I, we have limited time, but the things you're saying are all super fascinating and I want to get some clarity on some of them. So are, what what is the lead indicator here? So are you saying that we should be reacting specifically to ETH price uh, 24 hours? Uh, uh, look, after I'm, I'm increases, sure. Or are you talking about inventory specifically? I'm not sure how to finesse it, right? But I can tell you that when ETH is falling, our inventories will be growing and that is the lead indicator for needing to increase the stability fee. Now, something that we worked out here to take it into account so we can have appropriate disclosure of this, these data points and be reacting to them in the appropriate time frame. Getting it to the point where it's at today, uh, you know, we're reacting a little bit too late, which is why the price has moved. Ideally, we'd be a bit more ahead of the curve um, and well, that's that's where I'm, that's what I'm trying to I'm trying to corner you into giving me a, a timeline or a, a date window, right? Because this is something that we're wrestling with. I, yeah. I touched on at the top of the call where how do we remain uh, responsive enough to implement changes when they when they're needed? How do we keep the velocity and visibility up? And so, with the purely mechanically speaking, we've we've actually pulled out a Gantt chart in order to figure this out, and we're looking at like maybe 12 days from uh, discussion to a vote. And that's obviously not gonna work. And so we're trying to figure out what appropriate lead times are. And so uh, what I'm hoping that you'll do for us is say that, hey guys, if Ether goes up 5% in 24 hours, we need to change the stability fee by X. Like, is that the kind of numbers that you're thinking about? Yeah, look, I don't have phone numbers in mind, but uh, <laughs> basically, we need we need to be we need to be acting acting earlier. I think you know maybe a few we can discuss a bit more of this on future calls when we've kind of thought about it all a bit more. Um, yeah, I, I, would say that, I would say that if your inventories are growing, you know, over like twenty percent week on week, uh, then you should be moving the stability fee preemptively. Um, or just letting the, the price float a little bit more so everybody can see what's happening. Um, yeah. and one, actionable, what, one actionable thing off this call, because Louie and I were just discussing this before the call, um, and we have uh, discussed this matter on prior um, maker calls, is how to get uh, market maker data. And if we have benevolent market makers, I mean, we have maker the maker team itself, um, we have wire, um, I don't know if there's a third market maker who would be willing to provide data and not necessarily revealing absolute numbers of inventory, but Louis' idea had been just showing um, relative changes, yeah. you know, so percentage changes. And it's not, um, if we can get a representative enough sample, we don't need every single market maker um, to be giving us data. Well, that sounds interesting. Cyrus, is that something that's... Data. Is, is that something that's under discussion right now, or maybe something's already happening? Is, is yeah, there sort of these I mean, relationships with other desks that you guys use to have a, a discussion? Uh, I would say for for uh, Maker and Wire, you know, we'll obviously be happy to disclose. For other trading desks, they have no reason to treat Maker and Die special like versus any other asset they trade. Right. Um, there's so, there's a lot to unpack here in that, you know, even if we get disclosure from from market maker desks there's also you know having you know having to track accuracy uh you know just you know trying to make scientific risk risk governance decisions based on the pure goodwill of certain large yeah. trading stakeholders is not it's not well, necessarily the, wonder, the most desirable yeah i, I wonder can see that it's a good tool but i wonder, yeah. I wonder if there's a way to um, I, I don't have the answer for how to, this is the, really the question is, how do you take into account what is naturally an opaque data point, but it is actually the lead indicator, right? So uh, I think some more like work and thinking needs to be done here. Um, perhaps the solution can, yeah, I, I don't have the right answer, but I feel like something Chris, needs to be done. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. continue to work on this, Chris, do you have a suggestion? Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the ways that I've been kind of thinking about this, because total agreement that that this is like this is very useful data for determining uh, the, the die uh, die rates right uh, is if it's possible to anonymously share this data and then have some sort of output where you know like to essentially like you know stark it or snark it or or do whatever um, and then to have maybe not like the end-all be-all data point but just to have like a rough heuristic of like something that's really useful um, and that's I mean that's kind of one path forward, maybe. Yeah, I, th I yeah, think I there's think a lot to discuss here. Um, yeah. 
I mean, this is this is really a uh, part of a much larger conversation that I think we can I'm happy to have on another uh, governance call. I also well, think you, that we need to wrap up a few things uh, before this. Yeah, one I was about to help you out with that, but I just want to jump yeah. in first. Um, I posted a link to a discussion thread in Reddit in the side. I'll do it again. This this is precisely why I've been making these uh, dual posts because uh, a lot of really interesting things are going to come out of these calls, but we need to be cognizant that we don't uh, propose and make decisions and aggregate all the data in these calls. That's impossible. So let's get the good ideas out there and let's continue the chats in Reddit. Uh, it's obviously not the ultimate solution right now, but it's better than the one we have. So we'll continue to iterate on that. But as uh, Cyrus was about to point out, we only have seven minutes left. So it would be great yeah. so, if you can run through the rest of the risk. Yeah, I'm going to speed call. through this. This is yeah. you know probably the most important part of the call. Um, so the governance poll is passed. Uh, I believe we're going to initiate an executive vote to actually implement the 2% change tomorrow. Is that correct, Rich, uh, tomorrow? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Tomorrow. Um, when that vote goes in, uh, the, the rate will be, uh, the stability fee will rise. And at that point, we will begin, you know, gauging the market data again. It would have been nice if we had seen some sort of meaningful impact purely off the governance poll, but that obviously did not happen. So the few options, uh, you know, a few different scenarios to talk about. One is that the stability fee increase is a rousing success and we see convergence to the target rate quickly. Um, that would be obviously great. I think it's safe, fair to say that a lot of us are preparing for the event, the, the fact that that may not happen. So the two remaining scenarios is, as we see them on the risk team is that um, one is a small, but a, a noticeable change, you know, some upward pressure, but not all the way. Um, I think if that were to be the case, the suggestion would be to kind of keep the cadence going, keep the momentum going and propose you know, just kind of same same amount, maybe same schedule, um, another two percent. If if we see no change, like we did on the last two um, last two increases, and you know we see continued dive volatility, like um, we have, you know, since we even just discussed this last week, I would imagine that there would be more forceful options at play. Um, you know, there's been a lot of informal discussion on you know three. 4% raises or, you know, whatever it might be, I think that would be a discussion for probably after the executive vote passes and we can maybe um, have some time to gauge the data. Um, those are, I think, those were kind of the proposals that uh, we have internally. Any questions or thoughts on that? I would, I would sway away from accelerating the number even higher. I mean, it's already a 2% jump. Ignore the, the metric of one and a half going to three and a half, but really just the point that it's exponentially making it even more than that. It should be more like Novocaine. You just give it time. It will take effect if you keep doing 2% every two weeks. Right. But, but I mean, imagine that it would just went from half a percent to three and a half percent and we just saw no change whatsoever. Um, I think it's, you know, you could almost think about that as like it was one change that had no effect and potentially another 3% cadence yeah. might be justified. But I mean, that's, that's, it's an interesting point that we should probably make here is that the, in the last uh, iteration of the voting, a polling and voting process, we use the governance poll uh, to discuss what a rate uh, increase would look like. And that is unusual uh, if you have clarity on how, how we propose the entire scientific governance process to work because the idea is that we present uh, a model or some the risk team presents a model with data and evidence and you know like a jupyter notebook or something where everybody can just determine whether this uh, proposed rate increase uh, back tests correctly um, but the the reason why we're positioning things the way we are right now is that we're involved in a discovery process where we don't understand uh, we, we don't have a clear signal in the noise uh, for our previous uh, increases uh, as opposed to, you know, like uh, price of Ethereum or all the rest of the compounding factors. So in order to um, figure out how we collect this data, 
we're relying on the wisdom of the crowd to a certain extent, as well as the wisdom of the internal risk team to make some best guesses. Uh, obviously, at some point in the very near future, I hope that will be behind us, and we're just it's just a matter of us looking at data and, and making appropriate results from that. But I think that what we might see, uh, if there's no clear uh, signal coming out of the, the, the next race, we'll probably uh, investigate the, the same process we did the last time where there'll be a governance poll. And I think that that governance poll will probably include two options, one uh, conservative and maybe one slightly less conservative uh, rate increase, and we'll let the community decide. But yeah. the, the clarity around that will happen in the Reddit thread where we determine Obviously, I, it's my personal opinion. We can all discuss it, but I think three days to decide what people think is probably too long, so we can condense that down a bit and maybe start doing these executive votes. Uh, yeah, and I, I think I think an important point was that the next governance poll could include uh, multiple options that we could kind of better gauge a, a more variety of different opinions. Um, yeah, and you know, working on the governance and the structure and the timing is all all aspects that we're working on. Um, Okay, uh, we have one minute left. So, Cyrus, was there any other? Uh, I mean, if I, can, I can speed through the debt ceiling a couple minutes. I know there's some questions about that. Um, a lot of people have hard stops. So I'm kind of, I think that we should sure. probably take that to the, the Reddit thread and we'll continue the discussion there. Sure. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I want to sort of put a bow on this thing. Um, I just mentioned it, but please let's uh, continue this conversation in the Reddit thread. We had a fantastic number of questions, and I'm reasonably sure we got to one of them in, in the chat on the side. So, uh, what we're going to do after this call is uh, make a record of these. But what I would really love is for people that asked a question that didn't get answered to please hit up that Reddit thread and ask it again so we can continue the chats there. Maybe in the next call, we'll consider um, using that Reddit thread instead of the chat to track messages or questions. So we make sure that we don't lose anything. We can pull the, the Reddit thread. But this process is going to be evolving over the next couple of meetings as we figure out what the mechanics of these votes look like. Uh, oh yeah, so we're at the top of the hour. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks, Chris, and thanks uh, uh, Nadav and the rest of the Dharma team for giving us insight into their mechanisms. Uh, thanks Cyrus for the, uh, the recap, that was great. Bye everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye.